in our old heritage to train our daughters to find a man who earned more, not just for her own self-interest, but for the protection of the children. Okay, um, say your name. Uh, Regina Lake. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Um, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about the um, study that was done about hours of work for, and versus pay. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you asked it was determined that men work more hours. Were those more hours of being paid by the hour, or was the, because every time a man works more hours, or anybody works more hours, it doesn't always equal to more pay per hour. Um, it just, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm biased by how we do things here. Um, we don't get paid overtime, and so more hours work doesn't automatically equal to more pay. Yes. And so I wanted to ask a little bit about that. Sure, the uh, answer to that question, normally speaking, I like to have questions be asked, and then I'll ask other people to c contribute to that, but because it's a technical methodological question, I'll answer it directly myself. Um, the, the, US, the study is by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they asked men and women um, how many hours they worked in the past week, and then how much they earn, and they just put those two things together. So while specifically speaking that what you're saying is often true, the aggregate, in aggregate, they have um, an explanation of like when, when certain people work certain numbers of hours, on average, they tend to work, earn, earn more than the people who um, work X number of hours less, less than that. Okay. The, 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 this is really good news for women because what we're dealing with here is in the myth of male power and why men are the way they are, I outline the types of differences between men's jobs and women's jobs and, the, and when a woman takes a man's job and makes the man's type of sacrifice, there is an opportunity for that 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 income to be paid to her, and so that frees women to be able, it frees us to educate women what we can do to help women earn as much or more than the average man earns, and I think that creates a freedom that we haven't often um, offered. Was that? They work less hours. They work fewer. <laughs> very, very good. No wonder they're paid less, right? <laughs> Yes, okay. Um, another question, say your name. Is it Jennifer? Nancy. Nancy. Nancy, can you stand up yes, so we can sure. all hear you? Um, I um, have a lot of problems with a lot of what you said, and I'm not quite sure which one to start on. But um, I agree with you that all of us have been indoctrinated in a dysfunctional mm -hmm. uh, method of dealing with each other and dealing with ourselves. Um, but we're all intelligent. You haven't brought us to the 21st century. Women have been educated as men and have recognized that, there's, that there is a problem with the, with the pigeonholes that we've been put into. And a lot of us have changed. Um, as far as uh, you know, the mater d's in restaurants, I go out often. And since I dated, and I won't share with you how old I am, I always paid my own way because I felt that I didn't want to owe anybody anything. Uh, and so I always made sure that I paid my own way. When I go out with my husband, more often than not, I pick up the check. But you go into restaurants and the waiters automatically hand, you know, whoever the uh, bill to the mail at the table. So there are a lot of... Um, circumstances that direct the way things are continually. With regard to men and the power of myth, uh, the myth of power, you're talking about personal power, we're talking about economic power. Most of the decisions in this country and in men in countries are still made by men. You talk about sending men off to war, sending women off to war. Why don't the leaders stop having wars? I mean, there are still a lot of things in place that are under the control of male decisions. If men recognize this problem, and I realize a lot of them don't, and you're bringing a lot of this to the fore, well then wake up, smell the coffee, and change. Make change. You're in position to change rules. You're in position to give other people jobs. You're in position to do whatever you want. Make change. number of issues in a row. Um, in the myth of male power, I literally address every one of those issues, but I'll, I'll do the best I can to give a brief synopsis of that here. Um, so you're, so you're, you're, you're responsible.
over getting go going to the goal line. All right. If I become the pharmacist rather than the doctor, <coughs> or is that lawyer? Because you know, you said women marry for economic reasons. The reason we marry for economic reasons is because if you want to have children, if you want to juggle life and career, then perhaps they need someone to make more money. That, for me, I, I have trouble with that. Um, does, he, does he separate the mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead. The point I want to make? I think that a much of your analysis may be a little postdated. Hopefully, there's a value change going on along with that, you know, with family values, et cetera. But bottom line is, I think the structure itself, you know, is really only addresses a small segment of the population and not the majority of the population. And, you know, in my house, when I grew up, <laughs> women always worked. Women were expected to work all the time and raise a family and do all those things. So I think you're really only addressing a small segment of the population, and that segment is getting smaller. Um, anybody else have any comments, and then I'll add my perspective to it. Say your, um, say your name. And and could understand what you were saying, and kind of looking at them and saying, well, gee, is that is that really a part of where they are and why they're like they are? I agree with Nancy. Um, some, of the, some of the data that you're using, to me, is, is outdated. You're talking about the 50s and the 60s. Um, at this point, when I go out with my husband, I agree. I'll pick up the check. It comes out of the same bank account. But we live on a standard of living because I work. I didn't marry him because he made more money or less money. I married him because I was in love with him. So there's your statistic. But I, I guess it's kind of like you asked all the men in this room, you know, why don't you share with, your, with, with the vice president and the assistant vice president? You're afraid to have someone respond to you or glaze over. That's a problem within men. Men have to deal with that. Women have dealt with the problems that we've had in the last 30 years. We've learned how to be more aggressive and not be considered bitchy. Uh, but yet still be tolerant without being too sensitive. I think it's about time that men maybe address these things within themselves. You're making an excuse and saying, but they've been that way for so long. Well, get over it and get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, say your name. Uh, Regina Lightfoot. Um, so yes, it's so <laughs> Regina. <laughs> Um, I had a question. Um, you mentioned the issue of women recognizing. Sure. Okay. Quick responses to Nancy's question, then I'll add my response to that, and then I'll come back to okay. your question. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Um, do you have a re oh, um, response to Nancy's question? Say your name. My name is Jeff. In response, uh, I'd just like to say regarding the opening up and sharing with the vice president uh, president scenario. It's like Wendell said, I take the helmet off and I'm dead. And for, I forget for a second that I, I'm after the affections of, of women. I need my job. I, I like my job. If I take the helmet off and I start sharing stuff, and I have actual personal examples of bosses in this company who would not look highly upon that, I guess my point is, where does it start? Yeah, I can be the brave one, but I'm out here in Courthouse Road begging for coins next week. So where does it start? I don't have the power to do that. I would love to see it, but I don't have the power to do that. am the major breadwinner in my family, not my husband, who makes like a third less than I do, okay? His problem is he can't escape that role that he's created for himself. And my poor kids, 
they have to deal with a working mother who puts in many, many hours, extra hours. What am I going to tell them? Kids, you're on your own. Get over it. Mom will be home when she can. And, you know, I mean, uh, well, well I, it, that's what I'm talking about. No, I'm talking about my career. If I tell my boss I have a deadline that I have to meet and I can't make it because I'm also a mother, because I also have to do that nurturing role, he's going to say, well, I've got my deadline to meet. Make your deadline. And if I don't make my deadline, what does that do to my career? Because I am the major breadwinner. We're in the same role. We're in the same role. To my, with this whole speech that we had, and I, you know, it gives me a better insight on where my husband is, because he's not, he's not in this world. He's still back in traditional 50s role, you know? And so I, I have a greater insight for him. But for myself, I'm thinking, not only am I there with the men, I'm still there with the working women, the mothers at home, running around doing all the other things. So, okay, then I think the you real know, you guys have to get get on with it. Let me work with some of these. Some the real of question is, where where do both of us start then to create this change? That's the issue. I mean, we talk about this all day, but where does it start? Okay. Let me work with some of the questions that are coming out of what Nancy and what all of us are talking about here. Uh, first of all, Nancy, if I am saying something in such a bad way as to communicate that this is women's fault, then accept my apology that's for. Okay. 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 Because I, what, the whole essence of my message is saying that we grew up, our parents grew up, in a culture where the world was about training the men to play this role and the women to play this role and that neither sex had power and that neither sex is to blame for this, but we all need to make a transition together. Right. So I what want... What I'm saying is women are making that transition. Correct. Men need to do the same thing. And I am saying that women are making that transition and men need to do the same thing. So we are saying exactly the same thing. Right? <laughs> um, and, and that's why when I said... Okay. When, and if I, did, if I said it in such a way that it didn't sound like that, then that's my fault and I've communicated poorly. Now, just as the women's movement helped us understand that it's, it's a multiple, that we all live in a very complex system here where on the one hand women, women who were feminist friends of mine often said to me, Warren, I'm afraid to speak up to my husband, I'm afraid to speak up to my boss, I might lose my job, I might lose my husband, I might, you know, that type of thing, and yet they had the guts to do it, and they did it, and that's exactly where I agree with you 100%. And they also understood it's a complex system, that we all feed into that, that um, it was very difficult for, for, for women to speak up if they felt that every man that they ran into was a, was a, was a, was a ramrod wall, and it was also difficult for them to speak up if, this, if there wasn't a system that was, was developing things like affirmative action and diversity programs to understand what women's unique concerns were. What I'm trying to share here is that in my work over 25 years with a, you know, however many men it's been, um, I have found that there's, there, there are common problems that men feel that they want to share, that they are experiencing, that when they speak up, they often feel they get shout, shouted down, put down, and told that it's not relevant anymore, if it's outdated, or what's the matter with you. And what I'm saying that what I think helps us as, it, as, it, as I opened up some of these issues and the men identify with them, the men here are basically going to watch, is there a safe atmosphere? for me opening up my insides, or when I do, am I going to be told, just change, I'm outdated, um, you know, that type of thing, or are we going to nurture them and, and hear their perspectives as well? And, and I can't answer, I'll start answering some of the questions that, that, you, that you've worked with now, but there's going to be many here that I've stimulated that I won't be able to answer, but the larger issue that I'm hoping that I'm communicating is that that atmosphere will create the safest atmosphere for the answer. And I think the only thing that I'm arguing with mm -hmm. is that your definition of power is a very limited one, that for the most part, men still do control economic power, um, corporate decision-making power. I mean, you know, maybe power is a wrong word because now we, we have too many definitions. Mm -hmm. But that they are better in a position to institute change, institutional change, corporate change, government change. Mm -hmm. uh, and that maybe what needs to happen is that their consciousness be raised and that yes. they start making change. We're all ready for it. We're just waiting. Okay. Let me, let me share, Nancy, what I think we can all work on with this issue. First of all, yes, men need to speak up. Women can't hear what men don't say. The system can't hear what men don't say. So men have that responsibility. Um, secondly, as men speak up, it's a complex set. 
it's not as easy as that. The, what we say is men have all this power in the world outside the home, and men say, well, wait a minute, that's my responsibility in that world. If I speak up, I'm going to jeopardize the people I love. So if I start saying, gee, I don't want to be that cab driver working 70 hours a week. I want to work 40 and get in touch with my feelings. My wife's going to have a response to that. My kids are going to have a response to that. That, that, that. that one person's decision, now, maybe you could say, no, they won't. But the cab driver feels they will. I'm saying to the cab driver, speak up. But I'm also saying that, his, that what he's telling me is like, right, my wife will kick me out if, I, you know, if I'm working 30 hours a week rather than you know, 70 or I'm try, choosing a job that I want to do fulfilled or I take off for five years to, to write a novel that may or may not ever pan out. Uh, that if I get in touch with my feelings and I do that stuff, he feels it's more complex than just that. Cab driver who's stuck in that situation. Why aren't you choosing the vice president of a corporation that makes hundreds of thousands of dollars who has the opportunity to get in touch with his feelings? Because the vice president of the corporation is what percentage of your company? But okay. they have an impact on 72,000 people. Okay, but he needs to deal, first of all, I think it is important to talk, talk with the vice president about that. And so that, that's not exempt from that. But we have to remember that the, one of the difficulties that we've had looking at the world in the past 25 years is we've looked at the one-tenth of one percent of men at the top and not looked at the what I call the glass cellars. We've looked at the glass ceilings and not looked at the hundreds of thousands of men at the bottom maintaining our sewers, doing the construction sites, and those types of things. Those are not outdated perspectives. Those are people that are working around us all the time, all the at the way. And, and that person at the top, his he has been programmed all his life to not ask that question. If he'd asked that question, he wouldn't be at the top. And so you have a sort of you know, a cyclical type right. of thing there. It's like when I, was, when I did one of these beauty contests um, at a, um, for the Mike Douglas show some years ago, the, the, the women who were the, least li who were the least likely to ask the questions, who were most insecure, were the women who were the Miss Universe, Miss USA, and Miss America. And every time somebody came into that room, they were asking, how does my rear look? How does my skirt look? How does this look? How does that look? They were the most preoccupied and insecure about the thing that they should have been the most secure about. They were at the top of the scale, the equivalent of the president of the bank, um, but yet they, because all of their investment was in how good looking am I, just like all of my you know, internal psyche is, is, am I the vice president of the president, they are the last ones to look. They have really, you know, it's scary for all of us, but, but, but we all feed into this. As we give, as, as we respond differently to a guy who walks into a party and he says he's chairman of the board of General Motors than we do to somebody who's reading, I'm okay, you're okay on the unemployment line. Uh, we, give, we give people, let me, let me, me <laughs> do what I, share a little bit more what I mean by that. M imagine, Nancy, if you, were, if you were married and you were pregnant and you said to your husband, um, do you like me? as much now that I, I have this big tummy as you did before. And your husband said, honey, I find you more attractive now than ever. But he went to a party that night and he started flirting with all the quasi-anorexic women at the party who <laughs> didn't have these, these tummies. In the, there would be a part of you that would operate and say, oh my God, I'm feeling very insecure now. I'm seeing that he's, up, you know, that he's saying one thing, that he loves me whatever way I am, but his behavior manifests something else. And the male equivalent of that is often hearing women say, I love you for who you are. I love you for, um, you know, for, the, for your internal soul. But then when somebody walks in who is the chairman of the board, they, she has a different reaction to somebody that, than she may have to him. And she's, he sees her eyes dilate just like she sees his eyes dilate. And, we, we're, and so I'm saying we're both caught into the system together and we both have insecurities about these things together. The best we can do with this is understand how it feels to the other person. And these things, for those of you that have 17, 16, 15 year old children, you know that this isn't outdated stuff. Unf I would like it to be outdated stuff, um, but it's still happening today um, for, for our adolescent boys and girls. And we're all, and I'm trying to all work on it together to get over that. But it needs to be included in the pot of diversity if we're to be inclusive of the males and the, um, as well as the females. Um, say your name. Thanks for the really thoughtful questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me add one more answer to that question that I think is very helpful for all of us. The first thing that Nancy said was about how dysfunctional these roles were. I'd like us to hold two pieces of information simultaneously. 
almost every therapist you talk to today will talk to you about the dysfunctional parents and families that we all came from, and you hear the statistics that 97% of us came from dysfunctional families. I would like us to reframe that. I would like us to suggest that our parents were functional for a stage one world where survival was the issue and teaching their children not to be in touch with their feelings was functional for mandating them to do what they had to do. And to say at the same time that what was functional for a stage one world of survival focus is often dysfunctional for a stage two world of self-fulfillment focus. That allows our parent, that allows us in stage two, or the beginners of stage two, to begin to say, thanks mom and dad, for creating the environment that we could explore these things, that we could hold these diversity seminars, that we, could that we could do all these things, and at the same time say to our mom and dad, I want you to know that you've freed me to be able to ask a whole series of questions that I know you never had the opportunity to ask. Thank you, but also know that in my lifetime, there are certain new functions that are functional for me. And that allows us to have peace with our parents and peace with our spouses and peace with other people at the same time that we continue to make the changes that I think we need to make. I am saying that everything we learn to do in stage one, the selection on the part of the female, of the man who was the killer, was functional for protection, led to the survival of the species. The, the selection on the part of the male, of the beautiful young female, led to the survival of the species. But now, for the first time in human history, the selection of the male who is the killer with nuclear technology has the potential of leading to the, to the destruction of everyone. The, the selection of the male who's just the protector selects for a type of man who learns skills at work that are inversely related to loving at home. The selection of just the beautiful young thing is a selection of a type of female who doesn't learn to carry her own and communicate as effectively and be as internally beautiful. So what was functional in stage one for producing a next generation has become dysfunctional in stage two for functional and useful communication. I'd like us to thank our parents for creating the atmosphere that allowed us to have that freedom to move to a new le level rather than condemn them as dysfunctional and tell our parents you were functional for the stage you were in and now thank you for creating the functions for this stage. But what I'm saying in the larger picture is that our genetic heritage is in conflict with our genetic future. That the challenge of the species today is to adapt to a changing environment. Species that don't adapt to changing environments go extinct. So our challenge is not to have a woman's movement fighting men or a men's movement fighting women, but to have a gender transition movement where we all learn to love together and we do that, in my opinion, more from the ability to listen and walk a mile in the other group's moccasins than in any other uh, method of being with each other. If that makes sense. Um, are we over? And yes, okay, one, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, say, your name name. Say, say your name. Uh, my name is Jennifer, and I was going to make a comment very similar to what you just said, in that I ha my age group and the people that I hang around with are between, in their late 20s and early 30s, all of my married friends, that, my friends that are married and are couples, they, everyone works, they both work. It's, it's, it, we're being raised in a very, we were raised in a very different society than our parents were, so I feel like as we go on, a, a little bit, we improve a little bit with each generation. Uh, I see a big improvement in mine over my parents' generation. Um, and, you know, our my, the circle friends that I hang out with, the women make as much or more than the men, and uh, the men are probably a lot more open than their fathers were, although I can still see that that barrier exists to, uh, to them really being open all the way. But my point was that there is improvement as we go into phase two. I can see it with my generation. Yeah, I think that there definitely is improvement. And I also think, um, and I agree with Nancy, I think that, that the improvement, and also what you were implying, that the improvement has really occurred more on the part of women developing options so women have options today that women never had before, but men are still programmed to and stuck into the same options today that we were in the 1950s to a large degree, and which is why men need to be speaking up. And both sexes feed that stuck to-ness. 
when a man and a woman um, think about having a child, either person can speak up and say, by the way, honey, uh, let's talk about who will take care of the child. Let's not assume that I, female, will. Uh, let's talk about your three options, male, and he can say that or she can say that. And when either one of them learns to say that, they'll both generate more options for the workplace and for themselves than before. So the valuable thing about what Nancy is bringing up is that the system can begin to change at any place. The woman can do it, the man can do it, the person at the low level can do it, the person at the high level can do it. We don't have to throw the responsibility on somebody else, just look inside of ourselves and begin this, the process. Um, any questions from Philadelphia or Newark? No questions from Philly. Okay. Any questions in Newark? We haven't heard from Newark. No questions in Newark. Okay, great. Glad we have contact at least with Newark. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for, and I, ho I hope what I've done today is to begin to stimulate some discussion um, and, and I ask if, I, if I've accomplished anything that the substance that I've talked about is much less important and the process of the way we create a safe environment to listen to each other, express our diverse feelings and heritages and value them. Thanks very much. Uh, Warren, thank you very much on behalf of everybody. Uh, this was, uh, this, we lost power I think for 10 or 15 minutes there. I'm not sure how it worked out in uh, Philadelphia and um, any other locations. But there is a tape, a videotape being made of today's presentation. And if copies are desired, you please call 215-466-5319 and request tape number PL-384-94. This information is on your screen in front of you. If you desire a closed caption tape, please request that also. And again, one more time, Warren, thank you very much. <laughs>